Hi, and welcome to Freedom Fighters Code Grey. This is a show where we discuss human trafficking, an issue that's happening across Canada and across the world. What is human trafficking and what does it look like in the Canadian context? What is prevention education and why is it so essential in helping end sex trafficking here in Canada? Well, in today's episode, I have with me a very special guest, Kelly Schuler, the Executive Director of Brave Education for Trafficking Prevention, who will be helping to address this issue and unpack her knowledge on this topic. Thanks so much for joining me today, Kelly. Oh, yes, of course. Thank you for having me on your show to share with your viewers, Michaela. Um, as you mentioned, I serve as ED of Brave Education for Trafficking Prevention, and Brave is a stellar team of survivor leaders, Indigenous community leaders, public health researchers, and education specialists, and I just I feel honored to um, have the opportunity to represent our team here today. Well, I'm so glad that you could come and join us on the show to talk about the work that you and your team are undertaking. But just to start off with, for those who are tuning in today, could you share a bit about yourself and some of the work that you're currently undertaking? Certainly, yes. Um, so I have uh, a number of projects that are very exciting and I, I'll be pleased to share with you about. Um, just to give you the or overarching uh, goal of, of what we aim to do is uh, we envision every child having access to age-appropriate culturally relevant sexual exploitation prevention education in Canada. And so I have a story that, you know, um, got me to this place and many of our people on the team have stories behind that as well and how their commitment came about. So I'm happy to share more about that. Yeah, please do. We'd love to hear the story that has kind of brought you to be involved in this work. Oh, thank you, Michaela. Um, it's such a it's such a big question and it could be a longer story but I'll give you the shorter version for today. Um, I had some frontline experience and helped some friends exit sex trafficking in my youth and I kept quiet as I really believed my role was to protect the anonymity of the people I cared about. And then a series of events happened that indicated to me that it was time to take action. So in 2013, I woke up one morning to flashing lights of a police car from a normally quiet intersection near my house where a girl's body had been left and I learned she had been trafficked. Wow. And then a longtime friend contacted me who was raising money for a film on the subject of human trafficking. And I finally opened my mouth and said, I know something about that. Mm -hmm. And once that film was launched, um, I organized a series of focus groups and interviews with leaders from education, law enforcement, and also leaders who were survivors and from youth serving agencies. Uh, that was in 2018. And everyone emphatically kept asking, why aren't we doing prevention education? Mm -hmm. So we looked at what was currently available and found there was a significant gap in the area of prevention education for young people. And prevention education, ironically, was non-existent um, in our findings for, for children prior to the average age of recruitment into sex trafficking. So it seemed only logical to address that. Um, and having a decade of experience in behavioral change and youth empowerment with Indigenous role models in school, we were well positioned to fill that gap. And then many team members since have come on board to support. In fact, if I uh, were to list all the supporters, it would take up your entire show. <laughs> Wow, what an incredible journey that you've been on. And in some ways, um, a recent journey as it relates to the prevention education focus. So you have the story of being impacted in your youth, of being aware of trafficking from something that's happened in, in your friend's spaces. But then this issue kept coming up over time and then moving forward in prevention education. You said 2018, just a few years ago. As you look towards 2018 to 2021, what kind of stands out to you 
as just maybe something significant as it relates to your team and the work that you're undertaking that's really been an encouragement to you um, as it relates to combating this issue from the lens of prevention. Mm, Thank you, Michaela. What stands out the most is the need for research. So there, and I would like to uh, mention, there are many people working in this area. So what stands out the most is the need for research in this education and also collaboration Mm -hmm. um, to really prevent child sex trafficking from happening in the first place and to bring people together in a whole community approach. Um, We can find collaborative solutions and, and work together Um, So that would be the one thing if I had to, you know, suggest that there's one thing that can make the greatest difference. Mm. Is research and collaboration, which we know are so key on so many fronts. And I love how even as you were sharing your own story of getting involved in this work, it began with listening to, listening to the stories of individuals who have been impacted in the community, but also listening to individuals who are doing something to learn about what was taking place, where are the gaps, and then discern how you could get involved. I was wondering if you could help share for our listeners and viewers today, what exactly is sex trafficking? I know there's lots of different types of human trafficking, but for the purposes of today, we're going to focus in on sex trafficking because that's the area you address. So what is it? How prevalent is it in Canada? And um, why is this something that we need to raise awareness on? So firstly, the definition that is most commonly used comes from the Palermo Protocol. Um, Human trafficking and specifically child sex trafficking uh, is reported to be a fastest growing crime in Canada and throughout the world. And we know it's extremely underreported. Sexual exploitation refers to forcing, coercing or deceiving someone to have sex or perform sexual acts for something of value, like money, food, drugs, alcohol, transportation, etc. And sex trafficking is human trafficking for the purposes of sexual exploitation. It's a huge problem. Uh, It's a problem that's been swept under the rug for too long and now we're tripping over it. Um, Increased internet usage means sexual exploitation has increased. And we often tell people that the most dangerous neighborhood is now right in your own home because of the access the internet can give to predators to your children. Um, One of the uh, statistics according to IJM, International Justice Mission, um, is that Canada disturbingly taught ranks top two in the world for people who purchase sex exploiting children online. Wow. So we need to shift to a completely new norm. Those are some staggering statistics that you shared about the realities of trafficking here, but also how Canadians are perpetuating this crime on the global front and specifically impacting the exploitation of children locally and globally such such a heavy such a heavy issue so what is brave this organization that you are a part of and what are some of the things that you're doing to address this problem that you've outlined Mm -hmm. well as i mentioned brave education focuses on research education and collaboration to prevent child sex trafficking from happening in the first place and it's our vision um, to or we envision every child having access to age appropriate culturally relevant sexual exploitation prevention education in canada that empowers uh, children and builds their communities of support. Um, That's so important to the success of children and youth is to have that community of support in place so they feel comfortable to have the conversations that they need to, to be empowered and to protect them and to discuss anything of concern. What does a community of support look like? What does that actually entail? And how does it relate to prevention education? 
Well, let me just uh, first mention that much of the current focus of existing programs is on older youth and primarily how to prevent girls from being victims. And while it's important to empower girls, we also need to empower all children, boys and girls and their parents and grandparents and teachers and others in the community to become anti-trafficking advocates. Mm -hmm. So when you say building a community of support, you're really saying we need to educate everyone. We can't just focus in on specific groups, but we need to ensure that trafficking prevention education is available for a variety of demographics within our society in order to help fight this problem. The other thing that you mentioned is making sure that there was age appropriate and culturally sensitive curriculum. Can you help to explain to us what does that mean and how do you accomplish that in anti-trafficking prevention education? Well, what's needed are everyday, regular conversations about how people are portrayed through sexualization in the mainstream media that children see at all ages about healthy relationships, about sexual exploitation, and in ways that empower all children in their families and their schools. So to quote our team member Alexandra Ford, also known as the laughing survivor, we teach the stop, drop, and roll of human trafficking prevention. I love that, the stop, drop, and roll of trafficking prevention. So great. And why do you believe that education prevents trafficking? Oh, because of what um, invariably when we give presentations, there are disclosures of exploitation. And most children or youth don't know what trafficking is until they're in the middle of it. And most parents don't know until their child is missing. But these youth, parents and survivors alike tell us that if they would have had this kind of prevention education, things could have been very different for them or for their child. Hmm. I've sometimes heard quoted, you know, knowledge is power and being able to be aware, to detect signs, to know healthy relationships and boundaries, all those things help people to make informed decisions um, and to be aware of ways that they can navigate society in healthy and intentional ways. Well, Kelly, I really appreciate you joining us today to talk about your experience in prevention education on human trafficking in Canada and leading this organization. And so I'm just so excited for us to continue this conversation after we take a short break. things you hate. You hate. There has to be two of you. It's the real one <laughs> and the one they take pictures of for the good of the country. It's the country. James Bond, license to kill. If we don't do this, there will be nothing left to save. I have to finish this. Focus. Better. Partner. Better. Sleep. Better. Breathe better. Love better. Work better. Friend better. Unwind better. Everything gets better when you get active. Hi, and welcome back to Freedom Fighters Code Gray. In today's episode, we're discussing the importance of prevention education to combat human trafficking in Canada. I have with me the executive director of Brave. Kelly Schuler, thank you so much for being here to chat with me today. It's been so great to learn from you so far, and I'm excited to continue our conversation. So as we get back into this next segment of the show, I'm wondering if you could help explain to folks why is it important to raise awareness, to educate youth, parents, community members about the realities of trafficking in order to help stop it? Thank you, uh, Michaela. So if, if children are prevented from entering into sexual exploitation in the first place, either as exploiters or exploited persons, the impact can be exponential. So this current generation of children can lead more productive lives, 
have healthier relationships, their families and communities will thrive as a result. So just a little bit of the bigger picture uh, first. There's uh, an old adage, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And in the case of child sex trafficking, it's even more drastic than that when it comes to the prevention hmm. of sexual exploitation. Um, the Joy Smith Foundation, for example, estimates that it costs $600,000 to rehabilitate one trafficked victim. And it costs Brave Education, together with our community collaborators, only $6 per child to deliver effective sex trafficking prevention education. Wow. So never mind averting pain and suffering of those engaging in human trafficking, either as exploited or exploitive individuals. This will avert cascading costs to every government program, including physical and mental health care, criminal justice system, and the social and family impacts, of course. So um, a shift to a new norm is needed. So how did it become acceptable, for example, in our culture to go to a strip club to celebrate the birth of a baby or marriage? Um, we can shift to that new norm where children and youth champion that it's unacceptable to consider buying and selling people for sex. Children are change catalysts. And you'll know this if you've ever had a child correct you about recycling or composting waste, for example. Hmm. And so in these everyday regular conversations, um, you know, for example, when we deliver sessions at camps, in schools, conferences, um, we deliver from single uh, sessions about what is human trafficking to 14 week programs and we deliver using fun film story role playing games and even our pre and post tests are delivered through games and the children get all the answers right. They invariably know how to recognize the signs, what to do upon completion of the post-test game. And they also know how to identify their five safe adults to have conversations with them in advance of any concerning issues. So these intergenerational connections, as mentioned, um, surround them with that community of support. And we'll encourage children to talk to those um, adults who they've identified and say, hey, could you be a safe adult for me if I ever you know, have something concerning? And that could range to, you know what, I cheated on a test or you know, I'm not feeling um, good about how this social dynamic is, is going. So, uh, you know, when we have um, customizable programming, also we can make it age appropriate and culturally relevant. So we have a menu of offerings on our website, um, braveeducation.org, for those who might like more details. Um, and, you know, we can have, maybe, uh, Michaela, you have some comments or questions about this, how to shift to new norms and, and what that means, too. Yeah, well, I was curious, as you're talking about you know, we can shift norms and mindsets and that children are catalysts for change, which I agree with. But some of the concepts that you mentioned, people might be wondering, well, how do these things intersect with trafficking? Like, how does, for example, addressing um, the norm norms that you mentioned of going to strip clubs connect with trafficking in Canada? Or how does, for example, um, you know, ensuring that children are provided with five people to connect with about things going on in their lives, how is that going to help prevent trafficking? So with some of those examples, could you help just draw out for us the connections of the importance of shifting those mindsets in order to help prevent exploitation? Yes, yes. So um, shifting those mindsets to prevent exploitation and how to do that really comes from the research and conversations that we've had with survivors and families who have experienced a child that who's gone missing. Um, so in that kind of um, setting, our um, 
survivors and parents have told us had they known certain things or had they had conversations or or been comfortable or known it was okay to have conversations it could have averted um, predators um, accessing their children and also um, from the viewpoint of survivors they've often experienced um, extreme events in their childhood, traumatic events in their childhood, without feeling like they could talk to somebody about it. So uh, there have been situations where, um, you know, most predators will isolate a child so that they feel like it's their fault or um, that they have desired to have this um, kind of uh, behavior where it's gradual. Often pornography is used to uh, groom a child. Grooming is when um, certain behaviors are instilled in a relationship with a child that will build trust and also isolate them from speaking to um, or having those relationships with their safe adults. Did I answer that question? Maybe you can <laughs> repeat yes. what your question is. Yeah, no, of course. I think you did help to draw some of those parallels. And we know, for example, that here in Canada, um, trafficking takes place specifically if we're talking about sex trafficking in lots of different areas like hotels, motels, clubs and parlors and on the street and um, in Airbnbs. And as you mentioned earlier in the show, in someone's own home. And so you know, it's important to talk about some of these areas of our society that we see and that people think is a norm to go to are actually perpetuating the demand of this problem. But Kelly, I'm also wondering, earlier you mentioned something interesting. You were saying we need education for everyone to prevent exploiters and people from being exploited. So can you talk a little bit about that, which I think would be really helpful for people to understand in terms of like, what do you mean? How do you, how does prevention education some, stop someone from one day being an exploiter potentially? Yes. So um, we would love to share the importance of this prevention education uh, with your audience as important for all sexes. And because it's an important part of the equation to shift to a new norm and we believe that um, this can lead to a, a reduction in children who grow up to be exploiters. We've also interviewed exploiters and have um, professionals who are working in the field um, with perpetrators as well. So we know that given our service provider collaborations, that the estimated number of boys who are trafficked is growing for one. So the stat that we have is 80% of trafficked children are girls and 20% are boys. And over 80% of exploiters are boys. So we really need to do better for our boys in every area of reducing their vulnerabilities if we can expect to improve the situation for girls. Um, we often will hold lunch and learns for professionals and advocates on the subject um, that are shedding light from our team and our network of thought leaders. So these sessions are from thought leaders in anti-trafficking, research, education, and culture. And we would encourage anyone interested to connect with us who might like to be invited to those as well. Awesome. Thanks, Kelly. And we'll be sure to share your website and links so that people can connect to those workshops if they are wanting to learn more. I know that you and your team are working on some really exciting projects and initiatives um, in the areas of prevention, education and research and development. Can you just take some time to share about what is it that you're working on now? Oh, thank you for asking. I'm very excited to share more about the research and programming we have underway. So we have a current research um, study in collaboration with University of Calgary and our multidisciplinary team of researchers from public health, education, human rights, diversity and inclusion, social work and economic development. And we're taking a public health approach to determine who is currently working in the field of prevention education, what is working and where the gaps exist in prevention education in Canada. 
So this information will help to um, share with all service providers to reduce du duplication and promote collaboration for what's needed to be successful in equipping children and youth in this area of prevention. And much of our next stages of research will also build on this. So some of those next stages are um, we have an upcoming research project specifically to address cultural inclusion in prevention education. And after successfully piloting programming in Indigenous communities over the last couple of years where we've delivered together with local Indigenous community leaders in a collaborative partnership, um, we're planning to do more of this. Our Brave Education um, Indigenous team leaders are prepared to consult and deliver culturally relevant programming, um, customized and in more Indigenous communities across the country wherever we're invited. And then we're working on a curriculum for teen boys in collaboration with a community partner delivering to youth who are at risk or who have already been in the system. And uh, we're involved in research specifically for delivery of prevention education for elementary school age children. So, uh, you know, this seems only logical that um, we're able to address uh, prevention education prior to the average age of recruitment, right? Yes, so since educating children, um, when they are most receptive to learning in elementary school, it's critical. Um, they care about hearing from adults more and um, they're also um, in a stage where they're looking for things that they can purposefully be at, um, advocates for. So um, we're investigating the best way to provide prevention education for younger children and um, very importantly again culturally relevant um, skill building prevention education that builds on their strengths to address vulnerabilities and to empower and protect the innocence of children. So we have a program ready to pilot um, that's been successfully developed in another region for um, elementary age children and we're also doing this research. Wow, Kelly, there is so much amazing work that you and your team are undertaking and I'm so excited to see the impact that this prevention education is going to have on the next generation to come and on current youth in Canada today in order to help end exploitation. So we'll have to have you back on the show to understand and to learn about what were the successes and challenges of rolling out this prevention education. But thank you so much to you and your team for all the invaluable work that you're doing to equip children to build re resiliency in our communities and to help prevent and end exploitation in Canada. If you're tuning into our show today and you're in a situation of immediate danger, please call 911 if it is safe to do so. If not, please call our human trafficking hotline if you're looking for information and support. This is the Canadian Human Trafficking Hotline that's available 20 24 7 and you can reach them at 1-833-900-1010 again that's 1-833-900-1010 thanks so much for tuning into freedom fighters code gray and we hope to catch you next time